everyone. Welcome back to the Corner Talks podcast. I have my friend here, a very talented actress, Malika Henny Hamadi. How are you? Good. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well, you know, just uh, surviving, you know, sticking, sticking it out. How are you doing? How are you doing these, during these crazy times? It's, it's crazy for sure, but, you know, we keep on keeping on and keeping busy and just trying to stay afloat. So, yeah, can't complain. Yeah, we were discussing before the podcast started, um, you know, we're both kind of busy in our own way. And as much as it's chaotic, it's kind of, it can get kind of crazy. Um, the important thing is that we're busy and creatives, you know, there's a lot of uh, catching up and waiting. And we do these kinds of conversations because we want people to understand that as creatives, um, we want you to see our experience, but also uh, if you want to be a creative yourself, you'll anticipate what you're, you're kind of headed towards. Um, right. So Having said that, we collaborated on our first project together um, last summer. I, yes, last summer uh, we did a film called Cracked. Um, directed you in a performance. Uh, the film was written by Kosa Akaraway and Danny Mariathis. And before we dive into the film, because um, I wanted to ask you about that, what made you get into acting and what was it about the art form that drew you in? You know, it's funny, like, every time I get this question, I feel like it's so generic, but not in a bad way. I, I just feel like a lot of people kind of have, you know, similar experiences. I was young and I would say like third or second grade, I was just always theatrical, just doing the most, so extra. Still am, but like a little more toned. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I just loved performing, you know, for other people and the feeling I felt when I was just, you know, putting on a show, like it was just gratifying. Um, so yeah, I was second, third grade, wanted to do it since forever. Um, and you know, with immigrant parents, it's hard sometimes, you know, to yeah. get them on board. Understandably, mm -hmm. I, I get it. Um, but you know, I just tried and I tried um, to kind of create my own path. And um, that passion doesn't go away. You know, we always create new passions, which is amazing. We should always have like different kind of things to to be interested in but um yeah I just continued um and then in high school got my first agent like right when I got out of high school oh, wow. and then from there I've just been uh just working as hard as I can yeah yeah that's a very that's very early in high school I wanted to go back to what you said about your parents um you know it sounded uh from that tone they weren't you know as, as accept, accepting seeing their daughter uh pursue you know the arts and uh, there's a lot of friends colleagues that they always say that a very few that I hear. Yeah, they were supported from the start. It's always, you know, no one wants to see their child pursue the arts because it's very challenging and there's no guarantee that you'll make it. And yeah. one of my friends who actually has a child now uh, says he can see that for himself because he used to be on Degrassi and he was an actor. So you would think he would relate. But now he's saying, yeah, I, I could see why my parents were very protective of me because no one, everyone wants to ensure that their kid, you know, has the best opportunities. Yeah. So how did you convince your parents or how were, how did they get on board? Was it because of the performances they saw or the raw talent? Um, I, I think they always knew I had talent. Like, I think, you know, I sing too. So I would always sing in front of my parents all the time. They loved it. Like they loved it, but in the confines of like our home, you know? Um, so I think what happened was, I think when parents actually see the work, when they saw my first short film, they were like, oh, oh, like, okay, like this is a real thing. Like, you know, and then when I got my first paycheck on one of the projects I worked on, they were like, oh shit, okay, she's actually an actress, but not in a mean way. It's just, it's it's difficult for immigrant parents to really, you know, see their child in that light. Yeah. And when they see that you can actually build a career off of it, no matter how hard, I think um, it's easier for them. So yeah, when they saw my first short film, and when they saw um, my first check for one of my um, projects, they were like, okay, okay. They felt more comfortable. Like, okay, she has talent and people are recognizing it. I think that's mm -hmm. also the fear for parents. No matter where you come from, I think it's like, will people see what I see and will they treat her right, you know? Yeah, um, So I understand it. I get it. Um, but that was my experience personally. And I'm glad yeah. they're on board. They're so supportive now. Yeah, no, it, it, it helps um, when your parents uh, support you because, you know, you need that 
mental strength uh, pursuing this path because we know how nonlinear it is and we know how bumpy the road can get. And I relate to what you're saying with filmmaking. You know, my parents were the same way. I, I, I like that you said, yeah, she's an actress now. It's uh, now, now my parents will like make jokes about the Oscars in LA because they start to see uh, whether it me getting to a, fest, a small festival or um, doing this project last summer, or now I'm getting uh, like corporate jobs, like through my videography. So they're starting to see that it's becoming, oh, like, let's say it's not so much a hobby. And, you know, I still have a long way to go and I'm nowhere near where, where I want to be, but just taking these small steps and having that recognition from your parents uh, means a lot to creatives. And I know not everyone is fortunate enough to have that, um, but it does help when you got that foundation, right? Absolutely. Everyone needs a foundation, no matter if it's, you know, parents or friends, you know, or like a creative group that you find online, um, you can create family anywhere. anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And your crew, your crew, your cast becomes your family too, right? <laughs> As proven with our last project, <laughs> we were all friends and family by the end of it. <laughs> so, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, going back to Cracked, uh, Cracked explores, um, you know, mental health specifically in young men. And just basically the contemplation of the man, you know, choosing suicide because he feels he's a failure in all aspects of his life, um, the way he is with his ex-girlfriend, the way he is with, um, you know, raising his daughter. And I wanted to know what was it about this subject matter that made you want to explore? I mean, damn, it was something different that I haven't personally been a part of, um, you know, just telling a story from the perspective of like a young black male mm -hmm. um, or oftentimes, you know, in the black community, like mental health is seen as like taboo. It's like, what, what are you talking about? For sure. like, pray on it, you know? So um, I was like, this is so great. Like this is, everything is a story, comedy, drama, whatever. But this for me personally was something a little deeper that I've been wanting to, I've been mm -hmm. wanting to be a part of. So it was really special. And I'm like, okay, like if I can be in, this project in any kind of way, either if I had like one line or like many, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so it was just the story of it and the reality of these issues um, just really spoke to me. So I'm so glad I was a part of it. Yeah, it's it's uh, so that's why I jumped, hopped on the project as well. And I told Kosa and Danny, um, you have to respect the story uh, in order to, you know, put your, your best performance, your best uh, contribution in. And that's something that struck me about your performance is it, it seems so natural, it seems so raw. You're coming from a very emotional place and it was genuine. And I think that authenticity speaks to what you just said. You, you respect the story. You, you understand these issues. You understand how it's affecting a generation, specifically millennials. And I like that you mentioned also uh, Black people, how you know, it's, it's enough where, you know, white people have mental health and then black people, they have so many issues going on as evidence in last year that mental health probably isn't even considered um, something that they can discuss, or maybe they don't even have the freedom to discuss or the opportunities. Right. And I think it's affecting um, really anyone, but to have this story be so specific and focus on a young black man and his family. Um, I think that was very unique. Uh, and, and it was something that, uh, we both wanted to explore. So I wanted to know, like going back to about race, race and, um, about that topic with this short film, I see many times, uh, that you're posting and I see on social media that you have a strong voice about racial equality and, uh, social injustice. And you're always, um, basically highlighting, uh, where, where there, there are issues and where things need to be solved. Um, why is it important to have these conversations? Great question. I love this question. Um, it's so important because I think we get so used to just accepting the status quo um, and accepting these traditional norms in society and culture, so on and so forth, workplace especially too, um, that we get stuck, right? And we wonder why nothing is being done to create real change. Mm -hmm. And we also have to acknowledge that it is, you know, the capitalist institution societies and we shouldn't be fighting amongst one another. We should be fighting these entities that are quite literally, you know, against us. Um, so it, it's just so important for me to speak out and 
use your voice in any way you can. I know some people, like for me, I love to post. I just started going to protest a couple years ago um, and I love to do that. Not everyone will protest, that's fine. There's other ways you can do it. I think the ultimate thing is how can we implement transformative learning and meaning like how can we implement these changes within real life, within our families um, where there can be some anti-blackness? How do we have those conversations in real life? How do we have those conversations culturally in society? Um, and in the workplace, like how do we really stand up for one another? Mm -hmm. um, and I understand like it's uncomfortable, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's not supposed yeah. to be comfortable, you know, and not everyone's going to agree with you. Not a lot of people agree with um, the things that I post and that's okay. Like, I don't really care. All I care about is if maybe one or two people can see what I post and be like, okay, interesting. They can think on it and be like, all right, well, I didn't think about it this way. That's what transformative learning is all about, like setting aside the status quo, the traditional ideals and thinking outside the box um, and how we can really come together and create real change, not this performative change, you know? So it's just about like the small ways, little breadcrumbs, everything counts, you know? We of course. Work together. So yeah, I, I use my voice in any way I can and I'm still learning, like it's, I do not know everything. You know, we all mm -hmm. wish we could. Um, yeah. It's in the process, right? Like we're here as human beings to learn. It's never exactly. Ending. It's important to me, and I hope you know other people see that too. But you're humble enough to accept that you don't know everything, and there are, there are times that if someone were to say this is actually inaccurate, mm -hmm. um, you're you're okay. You're strong enough to say, yeah, okay, sure. Like I'll, I'll, I'll re I retract that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's happened before. Like I post something um, that I from someone who I thought was a reliable source. And I'm like, and someone someone actually messaged me. They're like, oh, actually, I don't think this is correct. I saw it on this other side that's more reputable. I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. I'm learning, please like call me out if I post something that's not correct. And that's how we, I think we also have to think about our ego, right? Like it's okay of course. to be wrong. And it's fine to kind of like tell someone something's wrong, but what's your approach? You know, are you gonna go in combative and like yell and scream? No, like be like, let's have a conversation, you know? So. I think it's great. Be humble. Accept that you can be wrong. It we are not perfect, you know. So yeah, and too many people. Because um, I like what you're doing. You said that you post things, and even if people don't agree, you don't care. And what your intention is is you're trying to get people out of their comfort zone, whether they see the post, whether they don't, whether they, you know, take it the wrong way. The the point is is to make them think. It's thought provoking. Um, Tarantino, I always mention this on the podcast. He's my favorite director, right? And he did Django Unchained. Now I can see that being a very controversial movie uh, to be made. But what he argued at festivals and on panels is that I want people, people are now having a dialogue about slavery. People are now Americans that were in denial or didn't want to talk about the, the issues. Whether they like my movie or not, the topic of slavery is being discussed. And it's important to bring justice to these matters. Mm -hmm. And I respect them even more for that because, again, this is um, not a piece of entertainment. It's something that transcends into something better. It when you leave the audience, the the theater, you're you're thinking about it still. You're thinking about um, you know things that aren't discussed, right, on a on a on a daily basis. So, and it goes back to as simplistic as this may sound, because I have a lot of you know black friends. We all agree. Like there, there are a lot of them that were telling me, especially during the protests and things like that, that they would see people post and they knew that uh, they're only doing it to, to, you know, latch onto a trend. Right. And, and I said, really, cause I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that like people would go that far. In my opinion, it's, you should support the matter uh, regardless of, you know, what, what you're thinking. And he was telling me, you know, friends and things like that. And we both agreed that as simplistic as this may sound, cause I know it's a very complex issue, but it really, the way I look at it, maybe because I'm just a good hearted person, I don't see it that way, is it starts about being a good person. It starts about seeing people and saying, hey, how's it going? Or asking about their day, right? So many people are blowing it out of proportion. And while you're doing the donations and while you're you know, making awareness about this, start by making action by when you see a person down the street, no matter what color they are, ask them how their day is. Or if they ask you a question, don't respond with such haste or such bitterness. I feel like people are afraid to be good nowadays. Do you agree? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's funny that you say that because, you know, it was, I think this past summer was definitely 
an experience for a lot of people, black mm-hmm. and also black, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people, when they see that an issue is being discussed, I think some people feel threatened and it shouldn't ever be that way. You know, just because we're talking about, it's just like, don't like all lives matter situation just because it's not being spoken about in that moment, right? There's a reason mm-hmm. why it's being spoken. For sure. Um, and I think when it comes to that, I think people's like true colors come out. And, and just like you said, you know, do you think people have a hard time being good? I think sometimes people have a hard time recognizing their conscience um, mm. and think that, well, if it's not about them, then it shouldn't be about anyone. You know, so yeah. I, I think it's it's a complex question because there's so much to it. But I think, um, just like you said, it's just about one of the steps is being a good person and recognizing mm-hmm. that it's not just about you. Mm-hmm. Um, if we work together, we can tackle so many issues um, and really create something big that's beneficial for generations to come. Yeah, it's uh, it's important to not ignore these matters and it's important to always have that conversation for sure. And, mm-hmm. you know, the what, what we witnessed last summer is is just, that, that was my whole thing is it, there should be no topic of conversation. Like the people that, we're debating about it. The people that, I don't know, like all, all, you hear it all the time, right? You flip on CNN. There's, there's, I remember the autopsy. Uh, they were saying, oh, it was an induced heart attack because of the trauma. And I said, no, no, no. I'm like, th- that was all because of the, the degradation of humanity. Uh, th- that person knew what he was doing. And I know they have to have a trial. I know they have to have uh, some sort of, you know, the, the court system, but yeah black and white, right? Human beings seeing that every single person that I talk to uh, knows that it was intentional. No one, you don't, you don't even treat uh, an animal like that. You, you uh, let alone a human being. So it was just, it was just a wrong, a wrong sight to see. And um, I think that's something that needs to be discussed and rightfully so. (laughs) So having said that with those, with those topics, how do you, uh, how are you bringing them to your craft? How are you bringing them to your, kind of social media presence yeah um you know I think having this kind of lens of I won't say woke I feel like that's that word has been so like overused <laughs> when you have like a sense wake of up call. <laughs> yeah wake up right like yeah, yeah, yeah. when you wake up to the shit that's really going on in this world you know when you when you decide not to turn a blind eye to the realities that we're facing and for sure you know resent that status quo um i think it really gives you like a heightened sense of perspective and i think for me personally again i'm still learning there's still so much to go um but i think when i bring that to a character i'm always thinking again outside the box and i think that's so fan- fantastic because it allows mm-hmm. me to really dive deeper um yeah and i think if everyone just had that opportunity to allow themselves to be more open, it would be easier for them to really, you know, attack a character and really just, you know, rip them apart and try to understand the nuances and their desires, their objectives, so on and so forth. Like, it's just, it's so important, those small steps. Of course. Um, So, yeah, like, I just, I just tried to really think away from the traditional norms you know as as best as i can um, right and i think hopefully that will continue to help me um, yeah for sure well one thing i enjoy about your content and um i had another woman on the podcast where it's not a you're not posting just about acting it's not always like headshots and like a, a clip of a performance there's uh, more substance to it and it shows a diversity of what you can offer um, yeah. And I think that's important. Sorry, go ahead. Do you want to say? No, sorry. Um, I was just going to say um, it's important, I think, to have like different passions, right? Like right now I'm doing my master's part time and something completely different than acting. You know, I'm doing um, like the social justice degree, like right. adult education, community development. And it helps me, it really helps me keep me grounded. Like I'm learning about different things. Education is important to me that's a passion, right? Whether if it, whether it leads you to a career or not, I think, you know, if you like to skateboard in competitions and you're an actor too, if you like to fucking write or film anything, I feel like 
it's so important to not just not to say that just doing one thing is bad or that you're stuck, but I think right. it really opens you up to the world and to yourself to really engage in other things and other passions. Um, I think that helps you also dive into a character, um, but to each their own. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it incites creativity, right? It's the reason why I'm doing these podcasts. The reason why I'm doing these vlogs, I tell people is um, I don't want to be doing just one thing by making films, especially in a time where we're very limited to going out instead of, it being coming very depressed or pitting myself because it's, it's very, you know, the fact that I, you know, are, are, are set with all these emotions in my head because I, I write and I, and I'm already involved in that. You don't want to get caught up in those and in, in that, that mindset. And you want to find any Avenue you can um, like you're saying, you're, you're studying for your masters and you're exploring different topics of conversation that, that are of interest that helps you, uh, to diversify yourself that helps you to apply those those that knowledge to different areas of your life whether it's personal or professional mm -hmm. and i think that's very i think that's very wise what you just said is um because i was actually having this conversation um the other night uh with a friend and uh i was saying you know there's filmmakers i know that they didn't even go to school um like a formal education and they, they they're clearly more advanced in the in the industry they got this they got that and i uh, have a university degree in marketing from Ryerson. And in the time when I was studying for that, a lot of the people I know were making a lot of movies and they were getting into festivals. They were doing the things that I'm kind of doing now, but I don't, I try not to have regret because everyone has an, their own path, right? Everyone has their own journey. It's just like the lottery numbers get announced yesterday, or I mean today, and you say, oh, I should have picked these numbers, you know, in order to win uh, the 50 million. It doesn't work like that. You only know what you know now, right? Yeah. Um, is that something you kind of uh, struggle with sometimes is like th the idea of everyone's on their own path or are you you're already confident about that? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> I like, oh, I should have done this. And I and I'm so happy to see people I know, actors I know and directors I know or is that I don't know doing amazing things right now. And I'm just like, I hope to be there. It's not jealousy. It's mm -hmm. more of like, inspiration and I'm like oh like I want to be there maybe I should have done this and of course like we think we have regrets and it's totally natural to have regrets regrets but also like you said it's kind of like no but I did what I felt was right for me at the time and how can I apply that right now and for my future for my future career for my future you know personal life down the road I think just acknowledging and accepting that it's okay to do something different to have a different way to do something um, it can actually make you more unique. So yeah, I mean, it's totally natural to have those feelings. Um, I'm always thinking about it, but always trying to find ways to not bring myself down and use it to the best of my ability. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast where, you know, social media, it's very tempting, you know, you go on even this morning, you and you see things. And it's not for me, it's not so much jealousy. It's more about you you shouldn't it's not it's unhealthy but you kind of use it as a reference point like oh maybe i should be there but again everyone comes from a different path everyone everyone ha things happen to them um in an unformulaic way that's why one of my things i tell people is success has no formula like you could try at something for 10 years and then finally land a role and then there's some people that do two auditions and they're already you know main <laughs> make it big right yep. um like i believe it was the girl from game of thrones aria I think that was her name the young girl stark yeah no 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 worries <laughs> we won't hold it against you <laughs> um she uh i wanted to mention she i think she did like on her second audition she landed game of game of thrones because her first audition was another show that she did and i remember the interviewer saying like there's a like twenty thousand girls that she competed with was like i think that they're really jealous of you or i, I you're you're getting a lot of them pissed off <laughs> just saying that and she's like i know but like I, you know, I, I was very lucky and, you know, you can't condemn the girl for that. It, the stars align, as I say, right. It's, it, it's just was, that's her path and someone else will have their time. And um, I believe the same for yourself, right. As an actress is um, the right character, the right story um, you're, you're uh, meant to explore uh, will find you. Right. And we'll put you in the next uh, position to, you know, achieve your, what you desire, right. What you envision for yourself. And on that topic, I wanted to say as an artist, uh, what stories would you like to tell and explore? Mm. Certain characters? Um, 
honestly put me in anything i'll be happy but <laughs> a true a true right? a true aspiring <laughs> but like <laughs> choice if i had the opportunity to choose yeah like, yeah you know like i love stories that are difficult to talk about like mm -hmm. i love that shit like i love uncomfortable situations like i love you know those crying scenes those yelling like i love i, I love everything comedy everything i will right. watch everything i love hard too mm -hmm. but um yeah i think really i think it's because also i'm that kind of person who likes to talk about things people don't like to talk about like i love to really like hone in on those emotions and i know some people are like really blocked off with that and that's fine um to a certain extent i think but I just like to tell stories that will make you think, you know, I feel like that's kind of like a reflection of myself. Um, so I, I hope, you know, um, to be a part of something like that, whether it's like a um, biography or something that has to deal with history in a way. Um, but also I love sci-fi and I think more people of color and black people should be in sci-fi. Um, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? So in fantasy and like, you know, like why is, why do we not see a lot of BIPOC individuals in those kind of genres? Like, you know, we can be in anything. And I think it also starts with like the writing room, the director's room, the casting room. It starts like in, again, like it starts in every era of the spectrum you know who's behind the scene who's in the writer's room so um, yeah you can only hope that everyone has an opportunity to share that story um yeah yeah for sure and um i like what you said that you know they there's not any role anyone can play as as proven and there's a lot of times where i feel you know, instead of for marketing reasons, or instead of, you know, for the purpose of the studio, they need to make money or whoever's behind the creative process, really see who is the right uh, person to play the role, right? And, and if you, if, if, if that person happens to be black, or happens to be Asian, right? Mm -hmm. Choose them for the role, right? And I think uh, the audience, you know, people don't, I, I hear uh, producers, you know, you hear it all the time, too, on YouTube, and uh, those those round tables where you know they don't feel uh the audience will buy that relationship or they don't see the you know that character right yeah. and it won't be as believable if they were a certain certain ethnicity and they don't give the credit the audience enough credit you know they don't really they don't yeah. like we're smarter than we are <laughs> we're smarter yeah. than you think <laughs> it's just like you know with black panther i think Mm -hmm. a lot of people were like oh we don't know like what's gonna happen I'm like do you not know there's black people that exist that like to watch movies that like what are you talking about I know, you know? I know yeah it's it, <laughs> it, it's insane to me yeah and it's um yeah with Black Panther that, that's, a, that's such a great movie and and I love that that's another topic of conversation just the, the Killmonger like the villain and mm -hmm. I love that they gave him such a a powerful um genuine motive yeah. like something that like it, it you know what I mean like it intertwined with reality like it wasn't like a sugar-coated like this guy murdered my father when I was a kid it's like no it's yeah. like black people suffered for so many for so many years and you yeah. guys are living in like a mecca like a like a, a, a utopia and you're not helping right. your brother yeah. your brothers and sisters right and I have friends who yeah no I have friends who thought that Killmonger was in a way an anti-hero or a hero where Black Panther wasn't a hero. And I and I love the conversation it brought out. It's mm -hmm. a Disney movie was fun, but it really brought out like some serious conversation, you know? And yeah. that's amazing. That's what we want. And 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 uh there's a powerful line that always stuck sticks out to me. And and I pay attention to those things because th those are what for me, that's what makes the movie. Like obviously the set pieces and the visual effects are are beautiful, but the lines like the when he was offering him you know uh to spare his life uh black panther and he says unlike you i un, um like my brothers i knew went to jump ship when i saw I, i'm paraphrasing the line when i saw bondage or when i knew i was yeah. headed into bondage or whatever right yeah. like it was such a right yeah. just yeah. that line was like damn and yeah. that's that to me yeah. uh, when you rewatch it tells me you know yeah he has that villainous swag like that vibe to him but you can side with him you can say you know what why aren't you guys helping out you know because they didn't want 
to get involved and whatever, but it's, it's, it's not right. And that's why Killmonger was on a war path and he did whatever it took. And I love that he, um, like the director, Ryan Coogler, I believe yes. he, he, um, he's from Oakland and he showed, it's very important that he showed where the villain comes from. Yeah. where right because that's again reality mixed with fantasy and we see we see but you know him playing basketball and he sees you know that that incident where his father uh gets murdered and we understand why he has yeah. such powerful uh motives because yeah. he knows w- what black people went through mm-hmm. right he there's a lot of lines he says in the movie i can't again i'm paraphrasing but something to the effect of while you guys are all here you know having fun like <laughs> basically all high and mighty uh, you have no idea, you know, w- what it's like on the uh, on the outside for us, whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that important opening scene was to show the audience, you know, what what's to come. Another great uh, scene that I want to bring up is, and it happens to be Disney Marvel, is uh, <laughs> Endgame, where right oh. Chris Evans, right? He and my buddy, I was watching with my buddy, and uh, I remember like you know we're Italian, so he was like that. That's a powerful scene, you know, like he he basically passed down uh, the shield and he gave it to his friend, right? The yeah. Falcon, uh, who happens to be a black man. Yeah. And he trusted him with that, that t- to take on the reins, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's so symbolic on so many layers and it's, uh, you know, just, just so empowering to watch. And I'm so excited for the Winter Soldier and uh, Captain America, oh, right? So <laughs> I'm so excited for that. Oh my god, one division. Have you seen it? it was yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I, fi- I finished watching it. I enjoyed it. Uh, some people were not too crazy about the ending, or like, I don't know. Yeah, you know what it is, though? I think that a lot of fans have a lot of theories because there's so much material like to draw from. Yeah. And understandably, like, it's so exciting to really like think of theories and like, oh my god, it's, it's gonna happen. But then you start to like psych yourself out and it doesn't happen. You're like, oh, what yeah. the hell? But I thought they did something so great. So I'm really excited to see like the Doctor Strange, you know, and everything else that comes after it it's gonna be exciting it's gonna be good. yeah the the important i think the important thing for me is when i was watching on the vision is like are we just making it just to cash in because marvel's hot right now and i watch it i'm like you know performance was great um yeah. as um the scarlet witch um elizabeth olsen i believe her yeah. name is yeah. performance was amazing impeccable like uh, yeah just she she killed it and but it made you believe it made you understand because I've obviously watched the film going going into that um, that show made you understand why she would create this world uh, exactly. for vision right she, you, you you saw that she loved them it's not like they um, you know show, shoehorn that in later on yeah. Uh, yeah. that was yeah that it would make sense like they're kind of exploring after endgame where do these characters go what do they do well if they're human as you want them to be you don't want them to be comic book cartoons they're going to be people they're going to have a lot of regrets they're going to have a lot of demons and i can see someone like her who lost her brother if you watched age of ultron having that deep deep um grievance and doing whatever whatever it took to bring back people she loved so a very powerful story again uh i love i love i'm a huge advocate and that's something that i want to discuss about uh, the stories that i'm writing uh currently and what i want to create i love a powerful uh female character especially in the lead role there's just something about it it's it's empowering but it's also very seductive and it's just played in a nice way um and and i don't know why like i was watching aliens right (laughs) i was just watching aliens last night right and ripley like just yeah. a badass woman, unapologetic, you know, slapping people around. Yeah, <laughs> and, right? But you buy it, you buy it and say like, cause you know, they say like, oh, I wouldn't believe a woman in that role. It's like, okay, because you probably cast, no, but hold on, you cast the wrong actress, but there yeah. are women, right? Uh, I'm not sure, I don't know about your mother, but my mother, like very tough people, right? Strong-willed individuals that you can see them in roles like that, where it's like, hey, you're taking orders from me and you believe yeah. it. Like you just buy into it. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, sexist yeah. or misogynistic, you see that. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd listen to her too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's write these, you know, female characters with substance. Like let's, you know what it is. Usually it's like the woman comes in. Oh, I had like eight older brothers. So I know how to 
fix a car and I'm your love interest now. So let's make out, you know, and it's kind of like, okay, okay. Um, give me more, give me like a yeah. backstory, give me objective intent. Like, I think also too, it's, um, a lot of these female characters are written by the male gaze, you know, of course, and, and for the male gaze. But if you, if you're a man too, and you understand what's happening, um, within the feminist movement, so on and so forth, you can understand, okay, you know what, I'm going to write this character like this, Ripley, right? Aliens, Wanda, like it's, when you really understand what is necessary for a female character, any character, so on and so forth, you can really bring justice to them. And that's what we all want, right? That's what we all want. And that's, and that's what um, I'm not happy you said about the backstory is make them, make them a person. Like, it's okay if they're a love interest, like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all, we're all human. Like we understand like people, no, people <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And yeah. love uh, what, whatever views you have about it. If you look at any piece, any, uh, good movie there's always that undertone there's always because that's the the most universal thing that people can relate to and that's what um like for example on aliens that i just said that i was watching it's not a, a love well they, they kind of showed a love between uh hicks uh the character um like a uh, this uh, soldier uh, who was a man but it, i would it more focused on the relationship she had the love she had for this young woman uh this girl i should say uh, newt and you know how she would risk her life to to save her, right? And those elements are needed uh, in a good piece of storytelling. Storytelling stories that are devoid of that. Um, you know, I don't want to I shit on the Star Wars Disney pre- sequels because I do that a lot. But I really feel I really feel no, I'm serious. But I really feel like, for example, Last Jedi, they should have capitalized on a relationship with Kylo Ren and um, Rey because I really, I really felt they had that, that sexual tension. I really felt like they had that chemistry. Do you know what I mean? Like if you rewatch it, but they didn't go that far because they were afraid to, I don't know what they were thinking. They, they showed it at the end of uh, Rise of Skywalker. (laughs) (laughs) No, you have different views. (laughs) That's that's the great thing about cinema. Like we can have different views, different views. And that's totally cool. I think the way I saw it, I was just like, they set up Finn and Ray in the first one. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. there's something here. Or maybe Ray and Poe or just Ray by herself. But for sure. I was just like, it was so random when they tried to put Kylo and Ray in the last movie. And I know there was like a little rant, random lead up. But for me, it was kind of like he tortured her. <laughs> right. Held her captive. I think for me, I was kind of like, is this kind of like the love story? that we want for young children but I at the same time I understand that people saw what they saw and some people dig that and that's fine right but I think for me it was kind of like this guy tortured her (laughs) held her captive like isn't Mm -hmm. there Finn and Poe where's where's the good guy and I understand like there were layers to Kylo I get it you know but again that's the great thing about movies we can have different opinions and really like delve into them I think that's so great it's all about interpretation and I'm glad you you offered your perspective and yeah. just to give you perspective, like why I for made yeah. that reasoning is because if you watch The Last Jedi, you're absolutely right. There was obviously, he's the villain. He tortured her. He, you know, it was psychotic. Like, you know, what yeah. woman's going to respond to that? However, if you watch The Last Jedi again, you can kind of see a possibility and a little bit of believability because what I argue with my friends is uh, Luke Skywalker, you know, abandons her, doesn't want to have anything to do with her because he has his own issues. Um, they connect through the force. And she's, he's the only one right. that is around her the whole movie. And she's, and she has no one really like no connection to anyone, no contact. I didn't really buy the whole Ray and Finn thing because I thought like the chemistry, I didn't know if they were playing it off. I didn't really see uh, her being drawn to him. You know what I mean? But with the last Jedi, I see at the end, you know, when he offers her hand, I say to myself, it would be entirely believable if she took his hand because the whole movie is built on the fact that she's isolated and the only person she has contact with is the villain himself Mm -hmm. but maybe she sees a softer side or maybe she uses it as a way like this is my only choice right because I'm scared maybe out of fear right so there's a lot of ways you can approach it I just again that's my interpretation and the, the the point, the point is, regardless of our different perspectives, is what we mentioned is love, right? There needs to be that aspect of emotion involved um, right. in order to make it a, a, 
a story people buy into. And that's what you were saying also about that the male gaze is yeah. it's very important that you understand women and understand the, the, how they act in real life because 50% of the audience are women and they know what is believable, like how they would react in that situation. And one thing I wanted to mention that with Cracked, um, I, I remember there was a scene where, you know, you didn't want to uh, be part of anything anymore, right? Um, mm -hmm. The situation. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get it too, too much into it, but I, I said, uh, there were, the, originally there was a line like, like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And I said, ah, I'm like, I, I rather, I rather she go something like you've done enough because that's such a that's such anyone who knows or been in a fight with a woman if she says that to you you know you, you messed up like she doesn't need to spell it out for you yeah it could have been more colorful like i started swearing up a storm but if you really want to sting a man's heart say that to him yeah that's it like, right you have done you've done enough and the way you say it again the acting uh high praise for that like you, you sold me on that and uh yeah, that's why uh, you were cast. And yeah, we're looking forward uh, to having our audience uh, see this film. And I'm, I'm sure you're excited as well. Um, yeah. You've seen you've seen footage, right? You've seen clips yeah, of yourself? Yeah. yeah, great, great. Okay, perfect. So we can't wait for that. We're just waiting <laughs> on some feedback. <laughs> it's in festival <laughs> circulation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, I really, I'm really happy that you, you came on this podcast and uh, spending this time with us, uh, you know, talking about your journey. I always love to hear from creatives. I plan to do more of these with you and, uh, yes. you know, just more. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, the, the 94 collection, by the way, uh, that's yeah. something that we, we want to, you know, collaborate on. It's a clothing line that I, I started from my production company and Malika was kind enough to yeah offer her being a model <laughs> and uh, showing off the, the colorful hoodies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> When things get better, when things get better, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slowly, slowly and slowly. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling the summer. If every, if things just, you know, if that, yeah, that, I'm not going to say much about this, this pandemic. <laughs> yeah, that's right? not, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's uh, it was a lot of fun and um, thank you again for sharing your story. Um, if you have, do you have anything else to say to the audience before you leave? Oh, no, thank you for having me. This was so great. My friend Daniel, he's an amazing director, creator, all of the above check them out um yeah no just so happy to be here it was really fun thank you thank you so much guys for checking it out and we'll talk soon take yeah. care